introduced in Unreal Engine 4.20, Niagara is finally in early access. Niagara is the replacement for the Cascade VFX or particle system. It replaces an old legacy system that's been around for, well, 20 versions, along with, I think, in Unreal Engine 3. And we now have a more fully programmable visual effects simulator. It's node-based. It has modular behaviors. We can create our own functions and modules. It just gives us more. We're going to take a quick look at it so you can get an overview. Keep in mind, this is not a how do I use Niagara in depth. There are many videos on the subject both from gdc as well as on the official unreal engine forums there is documentation and for this video we're going to be showing you the content examples that were created for it so if you use the content examples project which is on the learn tab you can open up the niagara map and there's actually three halls in here with examples so let's take a quick look at it the older system looks like this this is our cascade system you had the ability to add in emitters. Each emitter had modules that were preset, and then you change those modules in order to make it work. Now, some of the issues with that was you couldn't really expand upon it, and you didn't have too fine of control in terms of timing. This is what the new Niagara system looks like. It's got a lot more colors, which is kind of nice, but it's got things in a much more modular fashion. First thing, you need an emitter. First thing before that is you actually need to enable the Niagara plugin. So if we go to Editor Plugins and the VF, VFX FX system, we have both Niagara and the Niagara Extras. If you turn those on and restart, you'll have Niagara available. All the Niagara options are under right click, FX, and then we have all of our options here. Systems, parameters, collections, emitters. Now rather than just having a particle system, you have an emitter or multiple emitters and a system which manages them. So if we open up our system, we can see a few things in here. We have our timeline down here, which shows the emitter that we have running. And then we have all of our selected emitters properties. And then we have the parameters that we can access and use for this entire system. If we open up an emitter, we find pretty much the same thing, except this is the emitter itself that is used in our system. And this is our default emitter. Now, the way this is basically laid out is you have your timeline at the bottom, which is nice because it allows you to adjust the timing in a visual fashion. For example, oh, I want to retard this playback by half a second. You just simply move it up to start half a second later. Simple as that. You don't have to worry about delaying your initial spawn. You have your parameters. These are your exposed parameters that you can then use inside of the emitter itself. So, for example, let's say when something's happening over time, you want that time value to drive something else, maybe the color, you can just use the time value that's inside of here. You can drag parameters from here and anywhere they can go into, they'll go ahead and show you. So like for example, the color variable, if it went somewhere, it would show me. If we needed to, for example, find out the physics, we could drop it in here because it's a vector. Our emitters are modular. So for example, if we don't want a sprite renderer, for example, we can just remove it. Now we don't have a sprite renderer. Our renderer down here is empty. If we want to add items to our renderer, we click the plus button and we choose. A light renderer, mesh renderer, ribbon renderer, or a sprite renderer. Okay, I want to do meshes now. I can go in here. Let's grab our little cone. And now we're rendering cones. We're using the mesh renderer instead of our sprite renderer. You can have both. We could have a sprite renderer and a mesh renderer in here. Go back into here. Maybe we want this, for example, to be a fire material. I think this is the one that works. Yeah. And then now, once it finishes compiling, you could have both your sprites and your meshes rendering out into your emitter. Let's go ahead and get rid of this one for now. It's a little bit annoying. Um, e things are easily adjustable and visible, visible here. For example, this is where you set different variables when you're spawning. Here's our sprite size. Well, this is a float of a range type, so you could make it bigger, for example. And now you have a minimum and maximum of spawning. Let's say you want to make it a single value. Well, let's go ahead and just, we'll remove this, for example. Now we have just a float of a solid value. Now they're always going to be 40, for example. Okay, instead of being a solid value, I want it to go back in there. Well, input-wise, here's my range. 
I want to be a solid float. I want to be a distance. I want to be a multiply. I want to be math, for example, pulling in data from other things. Maybe the color it spawns in determines the size of it. Different colors are different sizes. So you have all of your different variable types and values available to you in these drop-down menus. So that gives you a lot of custom ability. So, for example, we'll change this back to a range float, and we'll change that back to 25 to 40. Oh, F. There we go. And now we have it changed. And all of them are available, all your different types. So my spawning has all these different things I can do in here to change things on spawning, create new different parameter types. All these are available. Now, the nice thing is if you don't necessarily want this stuff, you want additional things, you have the ability to create functions and modules. And these will basically be additional things you can put into your emitter, do some math, do some calculations, check some things. Maybe you want it to spawn on the outside of a mesh. You can grab all that data and then output it back into your particle system. So you have functions and you have modules. Modules are the items we saw on our right side. These are our modules. Functions are functions. They are something comes in, it does something, something comes out, and that information can be put into your particle system. So looking through here, we can see the basics. You can walk through these. These are all nice and handy. It shows you the basics. CPU emitters, GPU emitters, sprites facing the cameras, blending things based on value, like I said, color, size, and things like that. Some more advanced things. You have beams, dynamic beams, multiple renderers. Based on the location, we'll determine what happens. Some expressions. This is how you can pull in items using custom expressions. You can see in here. The Z offset for the position is based on how old it is, and you can see it using math functionality inside of the particle to give us a different effect. Uh, simple collision, so how to set up collision, and then you have more advanced things, like for example, these items are going from here, they're being created in a mesh, and they're going to a target, and they are sampling the target's colors, and then those items are then going onto there. And if we pull it up, we can see, for example, at the top, we have some exposed parameters. So these are parameters on side of the pr on the particle system that the player can override your designer, so they can change our mesh easily in our designing system. No more needing to feed in stuff from outside. Now your designers can set up multiple particle systems, and then someone else can put it put in the system, and then you can use the details panel to change out variables, faster, slower. You can expose them all to the details system. So those are up there for exposed parameters. You see some custom functions in here, sampling the static mesh, the normal of it, and the position, and this is giving us where we're changing all of our colors. These are all using custom functions. If we were to go into the content examples, for, for example, and we look through here, you can see here's a custom module, accumulate nearby particle influences, and it reads in data from the mesh, and it outputs where it's at, and that's how we get our little effect where it's going from here and it's being influenced to the right to our static mesh. And other things like overriding the renderer and then skeletal mesh reproduction. So you can see this breaking apart a skeletal mesh or actually, well, breaking apart and I put it back together all inside of our particle system. And you can see we have our different custom settings. So those are the basics. Again, this is just intended to be an overview to introduce you to the new Niagara VFX system. It's very robust. It's got a lot more features. We have better GPU and CPU simulation, for example, based on the target platform. We have some things such as the ability to have new actual modules in there. We have the static mesh sampling like you saw. You can drive parameters as we saw by the custom HLSL expressions or math expressions. Particles we use in multiple places. And that's just an overview. Refer to the documentation on the Unreal documentation page. There is also in the release notes links to the GDC talks, which both show you some VFX done in Niagara as well as some more details. And then the content examples, which you saw here, has three different rooms with about 12 different particles that you can pick apart yourself.